Amen. All right, Psalm, we'll be in Psalm 31. If you have your Bible, go ahead and open up to Psalm 31. Um, I'm going to take the next two weeks, and we're going we're gonna to talk on the topics of grief and lament. Um, now, this is, this is not going to be the most fun two weeks of church you've ever had, uh, but I have been praying that it will be a helpful two weeks of church for you. Uh, grief is one of the lesser talks that we have on Sunday mornings in church. We don't talk about it a lot. We don't engage with that topic a lot. And yet, there is not one person in this room who is unexposed to the risk of grief. It doesn't matter. It's going to cross all sorts of socioeconomic lines. It's going to cross all sorts of health lines. I don't care if you eat spinach and blueberries every single day for breakfast. There are going to be bad things that happen in life. Solomon says there is a time to be born. There is a time to die. And with death, with the sting of death, all of us feel this thing called grief. Grief, just to put a a quick definition to it, okay? Grief is the heartfelt shaken sorrow over loss. Grief is the heartfelt shaken sorrow over loss. And here's what I know as I open this topic to our church body. I know there are several of you who have either sat on the front lines of grief or you are sitting in a season of grief currently. I I don't think I was prepared as a pastor. I knew that with this job would come leading the team and the different ins and outs of trying to be a a boss now for some different people and trying to have real conversations with people and courage and get organized and get some clarity on things. I knew this job carried a preaching load to it and I didn't know what that was gonna be like, but I was gonna have to preach more than once a month, you know, as I'm not the youth pastor anymore. No offense, bro, you do an amazing job. Um, (laughs) But I was just, I was gonna have to, I was going to have to preach more, you know, and I was ready for that. I wasn't ready for the phone call I got from one of my students probably three or four months into this role, um, and his father was passing away. I actually got the call from his mom. Hey, he's in the hospital. Can you go? And I, I felt completely unprepared for that moment. So I was driving towards McKee. I called Pastor Kent. Only thing I knew what to do, right? Pastor Kent, here's the situation. It doesn't sound like he's going to make it. What do I do? And he gave probably some of the best advice that I've ever gotten for this. And it, he was just like, hey, you don't have to say the right thing. There probably isn't a right thing to say. And the more you try to fill this moment with your words, the more you're going to take away from what actually needs to happen. You just need to show up and be a ministry of presence right now. Just be there. And so it's weird. You walk, I'm not, I'm not trying to like give you ways around the healthcare system, but if you walk into an emergency room, and you say, hey, I'm a pastor. They're just like this way. Come on, let's go. I'm like, do I need a badge or do I need, you need to like check my credentials? Like there's a website, my pictures. No, no, no. Just, hey, come with me. Okay. So, hey, I'm a pastor. I'm here to see this person. And they, they whisk me away. They take me back. And I mean, he is, he's passing away in the room. Like it's happening in, in live time in front of me. I hadn't been exposed to that. I wasn't prepared for that. And, and I'm sitting there holding two broken, sorrow-filled sons as they're just weeping as their dad's dying on the table in front of them. And I'll tell you what, I I was not prepared for the front line of grief that I'd have to sit on then, not just in that room, but in several rooms to come. It it is one of the most difficult parts of this job, but you you don't have to have me tell you that. You have probably sat in that room yourself at some point in your life. And if you haven't, you just haven't yet. You will. We will all have moments where we experience grief. And for some reason in the church, what we try to do is we try to minimize this feeling of grief. And I don't think we do it intentionally. But even when I'm, I have to catch myself, go through some of my own teachings. As I teach on prayer and things like that, I I, want to say things like, hey, pray until you are grateful, which I think is true. If you just sit there and inventory your life enough, you will have things to be thankful to God about. Salvation. Boom. There we go. We can move into a spot of gratitude. And at the same time, I recognize that that teaching truncates the emotional response of grief and sadness and sorrow that sometimes I actually think maybe the most Christian thing to do is to sit in grief a little bit, to not try to move on too quickly from the heartbreaking phone call, like to to the different diagnosis that just happened, to the person that's not sitting at the table this holiday season anymore. Grief is the heartfelt shaken sorrow over loss. And in Psalm 31, what we see in verse 9, if you have your Bible open, go ahead and look at just verse 9. We're going to look at two quick verses in the Psalms, and then we'll move kind of throughout Scripture. But it's shocking to me that we don't talk about it more because it represents almost half of all the Psalms. Grief and lament is 65 of the 150 Psalms that you have in your Bible. There's a whole Bible, or a whole book of the Bible called Lamentations. 
like there, there is clearly an emotional, I think that if, if grief is the emotion of this heartfelt, sorrow-filled, like sadness, brokenness that we feel, lament becomes an expression of grief. So as I feel grief, lament is one of the tools that I have to express that grief, okay? So this week, grief, next week, lament. But in Psalm 31, verse uh, nine, it says, be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am in distress. My eye is wasted from grief, my soul and my body also. For my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing, my strength fails because of my iniquity and my bones waste away. Have you felt that before? It's weird though, in church, we don't get, create a lot of space for people to say, hey, how are you doing today? And you go, I'm grieving. How often is that the response? Virtually never, right? How are you doing today? I'm good. Oh, good. I'm good too. Move on. Like we, we, have, to, we have to be a little bit more okay talking about grief. And, and actually, I think one of the best things that you could probably do coming out of this sermon today is grab a loved one that you know is going through it right now Maybe, maybe talk with a spouse. Maybe talk with a roommate if you don't have a spouse. Maybe you just get somebody close to you in your life and you just go, hey, do you still think about them? Hey, how often are you still just sad that they're not here right now? Like we just don't create those spaces a lot. Even the thought of me just saying that, you asking that question to a loved one, probably you just go like, I don't know. <laughs> like, that doesn't sound very fun. I wanted to just go to lunch and take a nap this afternoon. I didn't want to have that kind of conversations today, Right? And I get it, but I think we fool ourselves in thinking that the most Christian thing to do is like to to not experience grief. And what, how that also looks is like, why aren't you over that yet? Man, if you really love Jesus, he probably healed you and delivered you and removed you from that grief already, right? And so we think to ourselves that as Christians, we should have this shrunken view of grief. I actually think that, that grief, the way that God would invite Christians into grief is that God doesn't, he doesn't diminish our experience of grief. He actually expands our capacity for it. You read all over the Psalms, you read King David, you read Lamentations, you read Jeremiah, and there is this capacity to grief, but we don't just want to this morning name what it is and how we experience it. We also want to see that there is a way through grief as well. So God does not limit our experience of grief. He increases our capacity for it. I thought one of the stories that I'd pull just of an example of a grieving person is David himself. 2 Samuel, uh, starting in chapter 1, verse 11. Saul who was not good to David, if you remember the story, right? Like Saul had really tried to do some harmful things to David. Jonathan, uh, David loved, right? And, and when they died by the sword, it says, then David took hold of his clothes and tore them. And so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and they wept and they fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan and his son and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel because they had fallen by the sword. I, th- I think men, especially in the room, there is a prevailing lie in our country that if you cry, you are somehow weak. If you, if you are this kind of a response, like I just was, I want to continually appoint, appoint again and again and again to David. To just go, man, this dude, he, he stopped the mouths of lions, right? He's a pretty manly dude. And yet he was pretty in touch with his emotional side as well, what he was feeling. And so man, to grieve and to be sad and to be sorrowful and to weep and to mourn, those are experiences that we have as human beings. And to deny, to deny them is really to just to redirect those emotions to some other place of your life. So if you mask and suppress and cover grief, my guess is it's just gonna manifest somewhere else in your life. Maybe as anger, maybe as addiction. I don't know where it's gonna go, but if you deny that feeling, it's going to manifest itself somewhere. It's going to come out of you at some point. The mistake we can also make with grief is thinking that it is only over the loss of life. It's true. And that's, I'm so thankful for like the grief share group that's been meeting here that specifically deals with, it is a ministry. If you are walking through this personally, if you know somebody who's going through it, we have a ministry that that meets up in the different semesters just to sit and to process grief and grieving in the form of loss of human life. But there's all kinds of grief. Grief can happen in so many different ways. Uh, I have a pastor friend who says, uh, all change creates loss and all loss requires grief. So you can grieve when you're moving into a new house, right? You can be so excited to move into this new house and it can be your dream house and yet you can still sit in the empty rooms of the old house that you grew up in with your kids or your grandkids. Used to roam in these rooms and now we're leaving this home behind for another one. Some Some of y'all parents, you grieve this week. You sent a kid to another year of school. 
Some of y'all sent your kids to college and you are excited about it. You're ready to be empty nesters. Somebody in here is, I know it. I don't know who you are, but you're ready. And you grieved. It was a change and that change is loss. It's the loss of your, it's the loss of your, your baby being in your house. It's the loss of your little child grown up and wanting to cuddle in your arms. And now they're in college and they'll barely call you. Not because they don't love you, but because that's what college is. And that's grief. It's grief. Peter writes it this way. He says, in this you rejoice. What is in this? Well, it's the living hope that you and I have in Jesus. In the living hope of Jesus, we rejoice. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So trials can bring grief as well. You've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it, te- though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter is kind of helping us give some direction on how we move through grief, and that's with Jesus, holding on to the living hope that we have in him. But he doesn't fail to acknowledge that trials create grief as well. Some of y'all, you, you, are, you are grieving the life you thought you would have by now. The promotion never came. The job didn't work out the way you wanted it to. Here you are at whatever age and it just doesn't look the same. I was talking to a brother in this church this last week and he had lost his wife a couple years ago. And he said, I I am still grieving her. You could tell just in the tone of voice, he still missed her deeply. They'd been married for over 30 years. But he said, you know what I'm really grieving right now? The life I thought we would have at this stage of life. I was so looking forward to this chapter, this season, and it looks completely different. Grief comes in all sorts of different ways. I I was listening to a sermon this last week, kind of preparing. I I honestly, I probably would have and should have preached on grief and lament earlier in this summer in the Psalms, but I just didn't feel like I totally had my head around it yet. So I wanted to really think on it and, and really like ruminate on the topic all summer. But I was listening to a message. This pastor was like, people think I don't like dogs. It couldn't be further from the truth. Like, I, he's like, I've, I had three dogs break my heart when I was a boy. And, I mean, we can almost kind of chuckle at that, right? Grief comparing on the same level as like loss of human life versus loss, loss of a dog. But, but grief for our kids in that kind of way. He's like, when I was eight, my dog got hit by a car. I know what it felt like to weep myself to sleep that night. And parents, like, we should just be warned. We have a different experience of life and we look in different lenses because we're older than our kids yet their grief still matters. And whether it's something that's not as significant as we think that it should be, if it matters to them, it should matter to us, we should move close to them and sit in that grief with them. Talk about how they feel sad. Talk about the good memories that they had with whatever is causing them grief. Rejoice with them, weep with them, right? We can't be dismissive with this topic, I think is what I'm trying to say. He's like, people think I don't like dogs, but he's like, I just, he's like, I wanna save all my grief for like, pastoring the church that I pastor, not for dogs anymore. I'm like, that's legit. It's a good idea. I think it's important. I don't want to just name it. Although I think just even naming it in church, probably for some of you in the room, I can, I can just see even the emotion on the face right now. Just even naming it in this way, it's helpful for you. It's just finally we're articulating something that I've been feeling for a long time. But I don't just want to articulate it. I want to hopefully give us some help through it. So grief doesn't just increase, uh, God doesn't just increase our capacity for grief. He's also with us in our grief. And we're gonna spend a lot more time on this next week on, on how we lament well, how we cry out to God well in the middle of our grief. But what I wanna remind you today is that Jesus promises to be with us whatever it is that you're going through. And even if the miscarriage was years ago, God is still with you. Psalm 23, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Some of you probably still feel like you're living in the shadow of somebody's death right now. You still miss them. You still wish they were there. You still wonder. And, and the temptation, when, when grief falls upon us, the, so, it's so easy to be tempted into angerness and bitterness, to be angry. Why did that person do that? If only that driver hadn't. If only, maybe you could even be angry at yourself. If only I had been there. If only I would have known this phone call, this last moment, right? Last moments are so significant to us. And so you can get angry. You can grow bitter. I'm never going to talk to them again because if they would have, whatever the case may be, we can grow angry. We can grow grow resentful, bitter. We can also medicate. Like I already said, we can can choose to numb grief and try to 
try to just cope in different other ways just to not feel this sting, this pain anymore. But the best thing that we can possibly do is to acknowledge that Jesus is with us in our grief. And God doesn't just give us the capacity to experience grief. He also leads us through it. That's the good news this morning. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Jesus promises to walk through with life's through with you through life's trials. Amen? First Thessalonians, I, we use this at funerals all the time, and I think funerals are a great example of, of how we just don't like to experience grief in our culture. We're so, and I've, I've been leading the funeral service where I've sat with the family on Tuesday, and they say to me, Austin, we just really don't want this to feel like a funeral. What do they want it to feel like? A celebration of life. And I can't even tell you how many times people have articulated that to me. And then we get to the actual service on Friday morning and the coffee's warm and the sandwiches are ready to be served. And that family's not ready to celebrate anything yet. And he, can I tell you something right now? That's okay. I don't think a funeral has to just be a celebration of life. There will be time to celebrate life later. You can share memories later, but if you need to sit and be heartbroken for a little bit, that's Okay. But Jesus promises to lead us through this first Thessal Thessalonians verse. Read it all the time at funerals. Let me just remind us of it this morning. You already know this to be true. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse 13. He says, but we do not want you to be uninformed brothers about those who are asleep. The New Testament is gonna most commonly refer to people who have passed away as those who are asleep, as yet they're anticipating or waiting for something else to come, right? that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. Now notice, it doesn't say, we don't want you to be uninformed. You shouldn't grieve. No, no, it says you aren't gonna grieve as other people who don't have hope. So there is a different kind of grief to be experienced for the Christian, for those who have hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Now this, this verse it cuts really deep in two different directions. In the first direction, it says we don't grieve as people who believe in Jesus, like the rest of the world who doesn't believe in Jesus. We don't grieve like they grieve. And so if you're saying, man, it's another year that they're not sitting here at the Christmas table. It's another birthday that goes by, another anniversary that I'm missing them. Another, it was this day that I found out we weren't gonna be parents again. Rather than us continually going back into the past, what this verse tells us to, to think about is to say, no, it's actually just another Christmas now until I get to see them. And now it's actually just one more year, one more anniversary until I get to be with them again. One more time, one more day, closer and closer and closer to be reunited with the people that I've lost that I love so deeply in my life. And you know that to be true. You know that to be true. Every day is not a day. We don't have to think backwards anymore. We don't have to think in the past anymore. We get to think forward knowing that Jesus will bring us back together again. Right? We live in the already, not yet. Uh, we, we talk about this so often, but if you haven't heard us talk about this, that already is this promise that when Jesus came and he lived this perfect life and he, and he died and he rose again, he ushered in the kingdom. He began the kingdom already. And so now we can pray big, bold prayers like, uh, our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. As in, God, won't you do it right now? And so if you have received the diagnosis, we can pray for healing. If, if the relationship's going a terrible way, you're grieving the fact that this marriage is ending, we can say, no, I stand on Jesus' name asking for a miracle to take place. We can, we can cry out for the already, but we also have to embrace that we're in the not yet too. And so not yet is everything perfect. Not yet has heaven come fully. It will one day. And this verse encourages us to keep pressing on in our living hope of Jesus Christ. But the other way that this verse cuts for us, and this is where I want us to not just come to church to be informed today, but I want us to come into church today knowing that we're gonna be sent out of here intentionally. Because what this also tells me, that there's a whole world out there that is living without hope. That if a phone call rang today, that if, that if something broke today, there is a grief and there is a sadness and there is a sorrow that is void of the hope that you and I have. 
And I mean, I've, I've sat in rooms with some of you in this room while you're processing through the loss of some loved one. And yet we knew that they'd be with Jesus, that we would be reunited again someday. And that loss still stung. So what does it mean for a world who grieves without hope? I'll tell you this much. There's somebody next to you at your workplace that if they had something fall apart and you got exposed to some secondhand grief on their end, you'd want to, at the very least, be able to infuse some hope in that situation, wouldn't you? If, if you go back to the soccer fields later this afternoon, next Saturday morning, right? Everyone's going to be at the soccer field in the next few Saturday mornings. We'll all see you all there, right? There are people there. There are people there who are walking in a way and they don't have hope. This verse, like, let me, let me make a statement. I believe in hell. Do you? I know you think the answer is yes, but let me ask you the follow-up question now. Where in your life would the evidence be that you believe in hell? That's a whole different question. If we actually believed that this was it, eternal suffering was coming, why would we not go and share the good news of Jesus with somebody? Why would we not get off the sidelines and get ourselves into the game? You would not rely on me to be the only person in your life talking about Jesus to some of your friends. Oh, let me invite you to church so that the pastor can tell you. No, no, no. You would say, I don't think we can wait till Sunday. Something could happen. Uh, we want to have this conversation right now. It, is, it, it can be so awkward and difficult to start the conversation about Jesus with your neighbors. I know that. I know that full well. And yet, it's a huge burden. There are people out there who are potentially going to be grieving as others do who have no hope. This is our mission, church. This should be our marching orders, right? We should be going out and getting involved wherever it is that God has already placed us to make sure that we are sharing the news of Jesus. And if you are here today and you have not chosen Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've not surrendered to him, here's the promise that's on the table. And I, this is how, just so you know, this is how I'll officiate every funeral for the rest of my life, is that this world is broken. And that the sting and the pain of moments like that, they were never God's first intention of what was going to happen. God created this whole place and it was perfect and it was beautiful. And the first humans that ever got to grace this planet walked on a planet that was free from the harmful effect and the pain and the sorrow of sin and death. They got to live in a world without it. But then centered, sin entered in. And it affected everything. It broke the world so that there are natural disasters. It broke you and me so that we continue to do things against God. We continue to do things harmfully against one another. That is sin. But then Jesus came because no matter how hard we tried, we could never morally kind of climb up that ladder all the way back up to God. So he instead came down, put on human skin and lived out a perfect life. He made no mistakes. He made no sins. And he did that so that we could, in his death, we could surrender to him so we could participate him then with his resurrection. And when you do that, when you put your faith and your trust in Jesus and you say, God, I don't, I don't want to be the captain of my own destiny anymore. I want to follow after you. I'll tell you in this room, if that is you and you are not following after Jesus right now, and you, you're like, I have a truckload of questions about this whole Christianity thing. Great. Put your yes on the table today and let the questions work themselves out as you go. Put your yes on the table. Jesus, I want to follow after you. And I promise you the questions will start to fall into place. I can say that from my own personal life. Yes, Jesus, I want you. But how, how are you still good? When the, Great question. We'll talk about this next week, actually. How are you still good when this is collapsing all around me, when this is going on? These are just genuine questions of faith then to, to work out. But put your yes on the table. And what Jesus offers you is his perfect righteousness on your spiritual bank account. So now when God sees you, he doesn't see your track record. He doesn't see your mistakes. He doesn't see your sin. Even that thing that you're not telling anybody about right now, God doesn't see that when he looks at you if you're trusting in Jesus. What he sees is the perfect righteousness of his son. And because he sees that, now we get to relate to God as a friend. And we get to talk with him face to face. And we get to be his sons and his daughters. And we get to experience everlasting life, not starting one day when we die, but starting today, this day on earth. We get to start walking out in this way where we love and trust him. And he continues to shape us and mold us. We're not perfect instantly. Amen, somebody. <laughs> we're working this thing out. And slowly after time, we're being made into the image of the son. That's what this is. And that's the offer that's on the table for every single person in here. For those of you who have already made that decision, 
I hope that you would actually maybe write this First Thessalonians verse down. Write it down. And don't consider if you believe in eternal life. Ask your life if it believes in eternal life. Look back at your calendar. Look back at your prayer list. Look back at how you've been spending your money. Are you reflecting your beliefs in the way that you live? Ask your life if it believes in eternal life. But then for some of you, I, I, I can see it by the tears in the room. For those of you who are walking through it right now and you're grieving, and maybe it's the loss of a marriage, maybe it's the loss of life, maybe it's the loss of just your sweet, innocent little kids and now things have changed and they're different and you don't know what to do. Here's my promise to you. God is with you and God has given us some specific and special things that we can do so that we don't get stuck there. I do believe that God increases our capacity to experience grief, but I also believe he only does that so that we can walk and work our way through it with him and so that we can help others who are impacted in the same kind of way. And that's what we'll talk about more next week. If you would, would you stand? I just want to give a little moment here at the end of service just for anyone who is really just going through it right now and you're in the heartbreaking season of loss, would you, if, if that's you, would you just kind of posture your hands out in front of you? I just want to pray specifically, Holy Spirit, would you come on these people? Would you fall down on these people who are in desperate need of your peace that surpasses understanding? God, we don't pray that the emotions would just be gone right away. We pray that there would be peace in the midst of those emotions. God, would you settle their heart for people who never had enough time, but now their loss of a loved one means that they only have time. For someone who wanted just a little more peace and quiet in their life, and now it's just all too quiet and they're lonely. For those who were expecting their household would look like this, filled with kids, and it's not yet, God. For those who thought they would be married by now, and they're not yet. For those who thought they'd have this job by now, and they're not there yet. God, would you meet with these people this morning? Would you show them that you care and that you love them and that you're for them? And God, ultimately, we don't put our trust in any of those things that I just mentioned. We put our trust and our hope in you. You are our living hope, as it says in 1 Peter. And that will sustain us through the trials of today if we continue to fix our eyes on you, not in a way that takes those problems and just totally eliminates them, but in a way that actually ministers to us through them. As we'll continually wait for one day when you come back to this earth to make all sad things untrue. I think of the psalm that we opened up a few weeks ago where we said that you are capturing every tear in a bottle. Not one moment of sorrow is being wasted in your eyes, God. You are near and you are close. And I pray that you would deepen and strengthen the relationships of those grieving today. God, for the rest of us in this room, I just pray that you would give us a holy mission this week. Would you cross our paths with somebody that needs to hear about the hope that we have in you, Jesus? Not that we're because we're Christians, we're better than them, but just because we have a hope that is different than theirs. We have a hope that goes beyond just the circumstances of today. We have a hope that is unwavering. Uh, the grave is still empty. Jesus, you are still alive. And for that, we will continue to press on towards you until you decide to come back. Jesus, we love you and we're grateful for you. And we want to be carriers of your mission on this earth. And the church said all together, amen.